Okay, Alexander the Great. Oh, no. Okay, I'll make a fire edition of it. Before I have one help, but this is the one that's probably most easily available. Well, I don't know, maybe the first Avalon Hill edition is easier. And I don't know if there are any significant differences between them. So, this is a game, you know, if it had, uh, if I had gotten this early in my gaming experience, I probably would have really kind of liked it. And I would have put in the time and the study into it uh, to be able to play it effectively, <laughs> which changes the world, right? It's the fact that I don't understand necessarily how, well, I definitely don't understand how to use my pieces and um, how they relate to the reality uh, of phalanx warfare, you know. Um, not just phalanxes, of course, because the Persians have a lot of auxiliary forces available to them. The Macedonians had some too, but... Um, I think I would have put that time in and learned how to use my pieces effectively and how to play it well. And, you know, over the course of maybe 10 or 20 playings, grown a certain affection for the game. I gotta tell you, uh, I upgraded my rating <laughs> a little bit based on this play. It, it's got some painful aspects, things that I know why I rated it as poorly as I did, but it was probably a borderline rating anyway. So, in terms of play, uh, I found certain aspects, especially the way the archers are handled in the game, to be exceedingly painful. But it was also somewhat painful to record charges, uh, not so much those, but uh, to record charges, to record what units were locked in melee, unlike the games of the later 70s. This didn't come with a whole bunch of counters. <laughs> I still have the counter sheet, actually. <laughs> to record stuff. There are some blanks that I could use for that, but I was able to, you know, work around it uh, with, you know, notation on the map by stacking counters in certain ways and whatever. Uh, it's also a little strange to have the two units per hex. I prefer uh, later designs that have the idea of like, okay, multi-hex units that are actually more difficult to maneuver because they basically have to uh, pivot in order to turn. Um, I think that was a, a very clever addition, but this is from before that era and different things are being tested out. Um, the combination of the archers and the use of odds charts and, you know, these kind of complicated odds charts need innovation, but uh, they did. They do actually make it a little bit more difficult again to play the game. So the approach to the game is at least as difficult as, say, a GBOH game for me. You know, <laughs> in terms of like, oh well, I gotta look through here, find the right chart to roll on, and then it's just an odd chart where the actual mechanisms that I have to undergo uh, in order to, you know, resolve a combat and to figure out whether or not I should be making that combat. Um, the mental gymnastics of counting up where the archers are doesn't help that uh, something that I think is archers isn't very clearly so in the, in the rules what it is. Um, these kind of things made the game such a burden at this point in time that it's very, very hard for me to approach it. And certainly I'm never going to play it or anything the amount of times that would get me comfortable with, oh, this is what I have to do to get these odds, to get things to work the way that I think they should. Which means it's quite possible that either I screwed up my understanding of the rules because the rule book's not very good, or that, you know, even if I understood the rules properly, um, that I'm not in, that I'm not uh, utilizing my units in at all reasonable fashion, you know. Um, so those factors obviously are going to get 
they're gonna, they're going to come into into play in terms of the painting. There are a couple of really neat innovations to this game. First of all, I'm not I'm not absolutely positive, but I think this may be the first of the tactical kind of ancient um, board games, and you're seeing a mixture of board gaming technology or techniques with like odds chart combat and mini style movement very much like it where you know you have to uh, change facing etc and there might have been some of some of that I don't again I don't remember when Panzer Bush came out but you know um, but you're seeing that kind of not that that's ancient but you're seeing that kind of detail uh, going into play here um, I think that that's very impressive. Uh, I certainly prefer the steps that are made when you get up to, you know, not ancients, but when you get to uh, a Terrible Swift Sword, where you're no longer using odds combat for most battle uh, situations, you're using shooting, which I just prefer better, and, step, and instead of step losses, you've got, you know, much more finer grain step losses, if you wish, uh, where you're actually tracking the strength of the unit. But then, the morale chart. Now, some people complained about the fiddliness of the morale, I found the fiddliness of the rest of the system much more annoying. The morale chart I love. I think this actually does it better than more modern designs that I've seen. I don't know if I've seen anything do quite this before. Uh, I'm sure there are games out there that do. I just can't think of any. Where... Uh, I've seen modifications, I, I think, to the... Uh, uh, I think the modifications to Napoleon's Art of War uh, actually one, one of the sets had a morale uh, option where the armies gained and lost morale. The biggie here is that you get morale, that you lose morale for losing your units, and but you gain morale for killing enemy units, which means if the battle starts to turn, if you get a big advantage somewhere, if you get some good die rolls even, um, you can see your morale start to climb back up. Also, it's not just sort of this binary thing. Most of the games that I saw that had kind of like a, a morale for the army or whatever from the 70s, and honestly, ever, you know, I mean, GBOH still does this. Oh, look, your army's fine, then it hits a point and it breaks. And that's game over, you know. That's still here. The army has a point where it breaks, but it's not just fine and peachy. Built into the combat results table are the effects of the morale and the losses that you've been taking. Or if the local situation, or not the local, but if the battle situation spun and you're now increasing the morale, your army can get better and can take heart from activities and actions that are on the board. I like these things. Um, this works really, really well. And I didn't find it too much of a pain to track. I found it a lot harder to track who was charging even, but much more than that, who, who was pinned in combat and everything without the proper counters to reflect that. Now I could have gone and dug other games up for those counters. But I found that a lot more fiddly. Uh, as, as honestly, do I find, you know, the movement rules, which are absolutely, you know, necessary, right? This idea of like changing facing in order to move into an attack, etc. I found that um, also more fiddly than the morale table. Maybe because the morale table is so innovative to me in a lot of ways. Uh, Component-wise, I got very little good to say about it. This is serviceable. <laughs> but the counters the print on the counter is just too small for my old eyes. Uh, and in some cases, the unit uh, types were hard, hard to read, etc. Um, or not covered in the walls. The map is one of the most hideous and ugly things. <laughs> I've 
I've seen pictures of the Guadalcanal map. I think this kind of competes with that. But um, I never played that, never had it. And then the rule book, um, you've got a mixture of Gygax who was not well disciplined and wrote pretty iffy rules for like D&D. &D. Um, here, it's really kind of this slap together set of special cases in a lot of cases. Are they too many to keep your mind on? It's real close for me. It's real close. Especially when there's not a lot of sort of uh, rich central, I don't know, mechanism in play. You know what? In a way, sort of that heavy mechanistic approach that GBOH has, where look up this, now check this chart. You can't go forward without taking all the steps. Here, um, how easily, for example, skirmishers can withdraw and stuff like that, it's hard for me to grasp that. And obviously, of course, I jumped right into the advanced game because, you know, I wanted the most realistic set of rules that I could get. Now, <laughs> add to that whatever effect Don Greenwood had, and I have found Don Greenwood... I don't know. I mean, what can I say? I, I feel like Avalon Hill rules uh, blundered from one bad format to another for the most part. There have been a few exceptions. Um, I have to say Warren Peace's rules felt kind of right to me. Uh, some other games felt okay, but then there were so many mistakes and then when they come up with instead of rewriting the rules I don't know if this one was this bad they created these question and answer sections well um I don't remember this being terrible in that in terms of it felt like I didn't have to look at them very often but I don't know Like things like, can the skirmisher rule be reversed so that friendly units may move through them instead of vice versa? Yes. I think that if that's not in the rules already, I got a problem. You know, I shouldn't have to go look at the questions to see this. Uh, and it is not in the rules. It says that archers and javelinmen may freely pass through hexes which are fully occupied either in advance or retreat, voluntarily or involuntarily. But these units cannot end their turn on a hex occupied by such disallowed thus. Um, and it does not go into anything at all about the vice versa. This shouldn't be a question. Question should be, you know, okay, if you're gonna have questions in the, in the rule book, um, they should be the kind of things like, uh, I don't, I, I'm trying to think in this case. I mean, let me see what some of these, uh, yeah, I mean, here's another one that, no, it should be in the rules. May horse archers fire during their split move at a melee unit? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, that should just be in the rules. Um, okay. So on the other hand, this one may be is something that I could see kind of being missed and would f fit in an errata. Special rule number three states that opposing army commanders nullify each other's effect and consequently only the first die roll counts. Does this apply to morale tables to be used also? No, it pertains to the die rolls only. Okay, you know, again, ideally it would be right in the rule book. Uh, it feels like they decided to print the game with this set of questions, and it may be because it's the second edition and they collected them, but I've had first edition Avalon Hill games that have rules baked into these question and answers that, you know, this feels almost like an errata sheet. Yeah, like a series of questions that playtesters came up with, and it was too late, the rules were already published, and, you know, whatever. <laughs> or something that comes up after three months of play and gets added to the general. 
but not you don't reprint the game and then print a bunch of rules to, you know baked into a question and answer section that's just goofy um, and certainly first printings uh, of other games have this kind of crap and I'm, and I'm just like what the fuck are you doing you know you're just trying to make this more difficult um, of course this is from an era before word processors and such not so maybe it's harder to deal with, um, to retype set and everything. I don't know, but I've just seen too many horrible, horrible situations with that one hill rules where there was nothing similar uh, with the SPI rules. Sometimes you would see games that came with an extra sheet of errata right in them, as though after publication of the rule book there was uh, some mistakes made and, and caught and and, and that makes sense, you know. That's a okay. There was an error here, but certainly not not a not a situation that should be baked in as your means of getting the rules to the game. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure, you know, what what leads them to this decision instead of to add an extra page or two of information. I don't know. Um, were these the worst rules I've seen for an Avalon Hub game? No, they blunder around all over the place looking for, for ways of making the rules bad. Uh, the difference here is, you know, other companies that I was kind of familiar with in the same era, you know, the SPI rules, those always followed a certain format and uh, it was very approachable, very easy once you got used to it. They didn't blunder all over the place. Uh, Avalon Hill went from one bad rule set to another, really. Um, and, and I know that people point to some of the SPI games and say, oh my god, these rules are so horrible, like Armada. Um, uh, there was another one that people really pointed to as being problematic. But Armada is one of the ones that they point to the worst. I feel like Armada's rules are better than almost any Avalon Hill rule book, you know? Yeah, there were some mistakes, but most of them were... There were a couple of actual rules errors in it, and there were some clarifications that came out in the errata. And I, I don't know. Um, that's not to say it's a better game. Yeah, it's got its problems as a game too, but <laughs> it's a little dull. <laughs> um, anyway, coming back to this, uh, yeah, I, I found uh, overall the rule book just really, really unpleasant. The, the tendency to put examples in without really separating them out well enough and they just kind of blur together and everything. And you think you're looking at rules and you're like, what the fuck are they going on about? Oh, this is an example. That's interesting. You know, uh, without that kind of distinguishment, italics, whatever, to, to show that something's something. You don't have to actually state at the beginning, examples will always be in italics. I've seen games that do stuff like that. But I don't, I don't feel like you need to use those words. You just need to call, you know, have a consistent pattern and people pick it up and understand it. But, uh, enough ranting on that. Um, yeah, um, my overall feeling with it is, at this point in my life, I know that I'm not going to have the time to put into this game to be able to play it competently enough to get a reasonable battle. <laughs> and you kind of saw that in mine, right? Um, <coughs> I'm not sure it was an unreasonable battle, but I felt like I was constantly making errors with, oh shit, I meant to throw archers in there, or, you know, I miscounted and now I'm making a one to three attack, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. That's uh, the type of, uh, the way the battle works here and the amount of stuff that you have to pay attention to to figure out whether or not you're going to get a, a reasonable attack in, it's just so high uh, that it doesn't please me. And I know that there are systems out there that I can do a better job with in terms of that. Um, the basic odds chart type combat system, even though this throws a curveball into that, you know, those are a headache to me too. Take a look at the SPI quads or whatever, where I'm looking and saying, ah, oh, I got to... If I do a soak off here, I can in Stalingrad and stuff like that. If I do a soak off here, then I can get a two to one here. I have a chance of getting something important, and maybe I can surround this unit and destroy it and everything like that. That kind of thinking just never really appealed to me. Um, 
back when I first got into gaming, I had a few games of that nature, and I kind of said, wow, these are so much worse than, like, Stonewall, you know? <laughs> they just, they didn't appeal to me in the same way. Uh, at some point, some of them that had lighter thinking, you know, uh, uh, let me think, the Blue and Gray series, for example, I grew kind of fond of, but I still liked things like Bright and Field better, or, uh, trouble uh, reaching reaching for what uh, siege of Constantinople stuff like that stuff like that I tended to like more um, it wasn't terribly complex it was just it uh, it tended to handle the combat not using that that little odds chart the little odds charts meant that you had to do a lot of number crunching number crunching of that variety doesn't feel like I'm a commander. It feels like I'm an accountant, a bookkeeper, or something like that. I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'm spending too much effort trying to get the numbers to line up correctly. And I have to say, I'm always surprised when there's sort of an odds table based game that I like at all. You know, <laughs> there have been a few, there's no question of that. But I tend to stay away from them whenever possible just because. I much prefer making broad decisions as to, yeah, uh, I want to throw the majority of my force this way, and that should work out okay, and I shouldn't have to narrow it down and be counting factors too much. Um, of course, things like the OCS, I have to count factors, not just for the odds chart, although there's enough variability in there that kind of you still aim for that, you know, three to one attack or whatever, but you you can't guarantee anything based on it. And then all, uh, but that game also has a lot of factor counting in terms of getting your supply right and everything, which is kind of painful. Same thing with Desert Fox, which I like both those systems. So you know, it's not like I'm completely averse to counting, but I do view it as a chore, and if that sure doesn't pay off enough, then I feel like, well, you know, is there a better game out there for this? Now this, by the time I got this, maybe there were already better games out there. I didn't know about them. Um, and I kind of looked at this a little positively and a little negatively. It was too much of a headache, but okay. You know, there were, there were, there were the, uh, uh, the Medieval Quad that I just recently got, but I had played a couple of the battles from that that I liked better. Had more of a, more of a natural feel to it. Um, but anyway, uh, by the time I did get around to picking this up and playing it, it was really too late for me to be sucked into uh, this style of game for just, um, just because of the topic. There, there were already other games out there, other systems out there. There were many systems that I was aware of and had played that I knew that there could be something better than this for me. Um, however, if you like that number crunching and being able, you know, to try to position you, units so that you can cut something off and, uh, you know, get those outflanks, get those surrounded units, take advantage of, of the geometry of this game. I think it'll work fine uh, for people who like that. I don't know that it's the optimal game for it, though. I think uh, another modern system, uh, the uh, Ancient Battles Deluxe, not all that modern. Its origins go into the 80s, I think, but... Uh, I think that system provides you with a better little chess-like puzzle side to it uh, without so much noise and without so much number crunching. So, you know, take, take your options and do what you like with them. Um, but yeah, I, I have to respect this for the innovations that it has, some of which, I don't know, have even been matched, you know, that morale table. And it creating the combat charts. Now, I know that there are games where the morale affects your combat, but they're usually not 
a decreasing morale, a morale that's, you know, for the army that's on the field in a, in a, in a tactical battle. So uh, I honestly don't know of something else that works this well in terms of that. And I wish I could, I wish that someone would take this kind of morale system and apply it with some of the other ideas that have come out long after this. Um, for that alone, for the morale system alone and how that kind of works affecting your combat capabilities, um, I think this is very interesting. Now, what's missing is that's army morale, which definitely has an effect, but I would also say that there's probably localized morale too. Which is not just per unit, but if good things are happening near you. And that's kind of uh, something that we saw in the 1066 system, where it was trying, you know, to reflect localized morale with mass routes and stuff like that, which definitely that kind of stuff happens, where one unit breaks, more units break. This game may be representing it in other ways. And let me, let me get to that, because the historicity of this game is kind of interesting. First of all, uh, I still don't think that there's any evidence and nobody's claimed that there is for phalanxes being able to march backwards. <laughs> um, I just don't buy it. They might be able to give a, a, you know, 10 feet of ground back or something, but they're not able to maneuver backwards as far as I know. I, I've seen nothing about it. Um, that's glaring. Most of the rest of it seems pretty reasonable. Although, there, you know, there are some of these special rules that are kind of like, well, I understand what he's trying to do. I don't know if it completely and accurately gets at it. But the real problem that I have with this is because of the odds charts, because of that extra burden um, to understanding how to manipulate my units and use them reasonably, I'm not at all sure if I'm getting reasonable results out of things, right? You know? Um, yeah, at a very high level, it felt believable. Um, you know, I'm not going to see Cav being able to smash phalanxes. <laughs> you know, even that heavy Cav, it's not going to be able to smash a phalanx down from the front. Uh, and with some of the special rules where the phalanx is immune to any effects when hit from the front by certain types of units, I think you kind of get rid of some of that. It did feel like some of those heavy units disintegrated a little too quickly when they slammed into light units. Uh, things that I just don't feel like... Yeah, it, it, it seemed like some of the hoplites and, and phalanx units, well... If you, if you don't understand how to manipulate your units properly, and not necessarily historically, just properly for the game system, you could get bad effects because you could get an exchange result, which I believe requires you to take at least one step loss on your own unit. That's how I played it. Um, and, you know, you could have a huge unit just run into some skirmishers, and it takes a serious loss off that just because of a bad chart. Well, now, obviously, if you're, your odds are, are high enough, it's not an issue. Um, but, so, not a skirmish, not a weak skirmisher. But you could hit a moderate, light Persian infantry unit that should just dissolve in front of it. It should have no chance whatsoever. And just really be a speed bump. And for the most part, they look like that in the game. But man, you get a bad die roll and you get an exchange off that. And now you've just lost, you know, half of one of your big units. Seven points of damage to you. Not all morale damage, mind you, because the morale has this weird little cutoff. It doesn't matter if I lost half a phalanx or, you know, the whole thing even. Uh, as long as I lost three strength points or more, that's sort of the, the barrier there. Um, also, one of the things that uh, killed Alexander's army, he lost one of his uh, subcommanders, but and that's like five points right there. So uh, that that was uh, that's a big morale hit, which wasn't again more experience with the game, you might not risk them where, where the, they might end up getting getting attacked. But it's hard, it's hard to make your decisions on that. You know, it, it ended up, you basically got surrounded and got killed that way. Uh, again, it's the kind of thing that I think if you could spend the time uh, these days on trying to uh, acclimate to the game, you could have the kind of fun that 
I'm sure many people did uh, when they first were facing it. Um, for me, with my ridiculous collection and burden of games that are unplayed, and for my taste in games, this just isn't worth it. Um, but it's kind of interesting to have, at least to see these innovations and, um, yeah. I actually had more fun with it than I thought I was going to, so that's kind of cool, too. All right. Uh, one thing to say about it is it's potentially, at least, but I think in general, a shorter game than you'd expect. I mean, I break out one of these Avalon Hill games, and I expect four to six hours, right? Um, this, I think, is significantly shorter. It's uh, The morale can go real fast. Um, and one of the neat things about the morale is if two armies clash and they're kind of just fighting, they fatigue. They're morale of both armies starts dropping. It's only, the only way you can make up that morale is to kind of start beating the enemy. And if you're, if you're winning big, greatly enough for your morale to start going up, you're probably smashing the shit out of him and he's going to lose off of that. No. But it, it does serve as sort of a, a leveling uh, factor to it. One thing I didn't really look at is the combat tables too much the effect of the morale on it. Um, but I kind of got the feeling. So I'm going to take a look at the two to one. Um, oh no, that's one to two. Two to one going across, two to one there. So the results change. So like if you're morale one against the morale one enemy, that's different than morale two against the morale two enemy. Trying to see just how. Morale level three against the morale three enemy. I'm not quite sure how they change, <laughs> but they definitely scramble things up. So there would be, uh, okay, morale four looks the same as morale three. Uh, but yeah, it uh, it definitely seems to move things a little bit around um, in terms of what happens. So for example, here the two to one, uh, morale one against morale one, no, no, you got the attacker back two there, but uh, Looks like uh, with more chance of an exchange here. I don't. I don't know what you know. I don't know what that all represents, and I don't know, you know, what kind of balancing thoughts were put into that. It's one of the problems I have with kind of the obtuseness of uh, a CRT normally, and this one has sort of things that baked into it that are obviously meant to express something, but I don't know what they're meant to express, and it's kind of like, you know. The phalanx is moving backwards, except I'm not sure that this is wrong. It's just like kind of, okay, but why did you make that choice? And that's the kind of thing I would love to see in the designer's notes. Instead, the designer's notes, I was happy to see designer's notes. Avalon Hill doesn't often put them in uh, their games. But they're kind of like, oh, I had a hard time valuing units. Uh, A lot of it's on history, even though history was handled, you know, could have been handled in the historical summary, right? Um, yeah. I don't see anything about sort of the clever stuff here. You know, he's talking about figuring out what values he wanted to give to different units as opposed to... Uh, sort of the innovative design decisions. Yeah, I mean, I assume you're trying to value your units within your system. Why did you decide on this system? Why did you make certain choices that you made? Uh, that kind of stuff would, all, is always of interest to me, and I don't feel like, you know, I, I feel like Gygax kind of didn't really worry about that, which might mean he didn't really think too hard about it. You know? I don't know. Um, anyway. Let's send this up. 
we'll see if we can get you something a little bit more modern soon.